Welcome to today's 3D print. Today I'm going to take you through the entire process that I use to make a project print. So I want to take this little monkey cup that came with the printer. This is actually downscaled. And I want to scale it up to something really big. Because I want to plant some lettuce in it. You know, I got these heads of lettuce that came with the roots and I want to plant them. So I'm printing out a planter. It's about a 35 hour print. I'm going to take you through the whole process. So stay tuned. Okay, so here is where we actually slice the pot. Now, I've made this larger. I want to reduce print time and reduce filament usage, but I also want it to be very strong. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this pretty beefy, so this is actually going to get used. I want to try planting vegetables, like right now lettuce. I don't even know if I can grow that indoors. We're, we're going to find out. <laughs> and um, so I figure that's about the right size. It's a, about a third of a kilo. It'll hold plenty of dirt. So it shouldn't have a problem. Now there's a few things I need to worry about here. So for example, I want to print this with like 5% infill. It's going to have decent walls and top layers. So I'm not worried about um, structural integrity of the shape. And But you do need infill. Because you know you don't want it to flex. Especially if it gets a little bit warm. So if you get close to the deflection temperature of the plastic. But not quite over it. Um, the infill could save you. It could hold the structural integrity of the product together and keep it from warping. So I do want some infill. Also, some infill is better for establishing more infill later. So I see several areas of concern here. So my first is I want this top layer to look really nice because everybody's going to see that. So I need good support on that underneath that top layer. Infill is basically interior support. So that is going to be a process. Now, I also want to have this bottom turn out really nice, even slightly water resistant if possible. I don't think it is. Um, I said 0.92 is perfect, but I see micro gaps between my extrusions. So I think I need to go to 0.93, maybe 0.94. I'm just a hair off. You can't even tell unless you look real close, but I'm just a hair off from perfect. So I see three processes involved here. Now there are some support issues here. So I foresee underneath the chin, of these guys being a problem this sh this might be an issue it depends but i definitely see underneath this chin being a problem because if you look closely that's a straight up island because this point here is lower than this point here but you know something i don't care you'd be surprised how forgiving 3d printing is that is such a small difference it's like one maybe two extrusions it'll be fine There'll probably be a little tail here. I'll have to snip off. No big deal. It's not going to affect the final print. So I'm just going to leave it. Because that's going to save me filament and save me hours of trying to print that support. And so I'm just not going to. Everything else here looks like it should print fine. I don't anticipate a problem. So how did I slice this? Well, I sliced it into three sections. This first section is the bottom up to the top of this inside here. This second process is from there all the way up to here. And then this third process is the top section here, where I want that top to be real nice. So in order to support the bottom and make it nice and sturdy, I'm going to use 25% infill on the bottom. And then I'm also going to use 25% infill for this top section. 25% inf infill is your... That's the basic line between um, getting top layers to connect or not. Sometimes you can get away with 20%, but 25% using grid both ways, you're pretty much guaranteed to get good top layers. So that's what I always use. In between, 5% infill. So let's go over the settings. Uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.92, 0 0.4, 7. This is all, this, this is my standard settings. This keeps getting changed to 8.2, and I don't know why it's annoying me. <laughs> I must be accidentally hitting an up arrow or something when I'm there. Uh, for layers, I have four top. Um, no bottom, I'll get to that in a minute, and three perimeters. It's more than strong enough for the 0.2 layer height. You know, I got my standard 10 millimeter um, skirt, 25% infill with a 25% overlap, no support, temperatures. So I always start off at 220 and slow. So if you go to layer, you'll see my first layer speed is 30%. So that's 30% of 60 millimeter per second default speed. So if you crank this speed up, you actually have to lower the speed. Because you really want this first one to be, you know, under 20 millimeters per second. Some parts of it even slower. You want it to be slow. That's how you get good bed adhesion. 
you can actually be slightly off on your leveling by a hair and you'd be fine if you go slow and hot and that's one of the reasons i don't use bottom layers it's not needed and it saves me about two hours of print well on this one about an hour of print time it knocks an hour off by turning off the bottom layers you can test that just by setting this bottom layers to three and see what the print time is <laughs> it's a pretty big difference um then what i do is layer but my normal print speed for this filament my normal temperature is 200. so on layer two i drop down to 210 and on layer three i drop down to my final temperature of 200. i do it in 10 degree in increments to avoid triggering a um a temperature fail safe or a um to avoid the fail safes if you try to go more than 10 degrees you sometimes bump into the tolerances they set in the firmware and you'll get a um, hot end temperature failure and the print will pause. It's a safety feature to keep you from burning down your house. So it's a good thing, but that's why I go 10 degree increments and no more. And then um, heat bed is set for 60. I did forget to put in my turn off. So I did that manually. Usually what I'll do is at like, I don't know, layer 50, I'll tell the heat bed to go to 50. And then at layer 55, I'll tell it to go to um, 40. And then at layer like 70, I'll tell it to go to zero to turn off. But that's only because I'm using a print surface that does not require heat. Heat helps, but it's not required. The print will stay attached. Um, and again, 220 and slow on that first layer really helps with this. Um, cooling, layer three. Just go at 100% layer three. It's usually not an issue. And you want those first two layers to go down hot and sticky to make sure they actually stick and you don't want cooling preventing them from sticking. You want them to be hot and sticky when they hit. Um, scripts, this is a 334 printer, or almost a 334 printer. So I use my standard X3 P300. That's just what I always use for anything CR10 sized or larger, anything 334 or larger. Speeds at 60 millimeters per second with um, an 80% outline under speed. So it goes a little bit slower for the outer perimeter to give you that little bit better quality. Uh, that's basically it. I do my single extrusions at 100%. Uh, that can cause accuracy issues, but it's very minor. But an accuracy issue is better than a part not printing at all. Now, for this print, that is a non-issue. But for prints with like little tiny writing, that's an issue. Um, here's my retraction settings. I turn everything on except for only retract and crossing open space. And um, I have avoid crossing outline. In Cura, I believe this is called combing. I set it for 999. This guarantees that it stays within the outline of the printer so you don't get no oozing. That's how you avoid those little boogers sticking out the side of your print. And that is basically it. Now on the second set, on the second section, um, same settings, you know, 433. Three. And a little tip, pro tip in the future, if your overhangs are not too high, you can turn off both top and bottom layers when you're doing a midsection that's not the bottom or the top of the model, and that'll greatly increase your print speed. But the I'll show you why in a minute what you're missing when you do that. That's why you gotta be careful. Infill, 5%, okay? Now, on the third layer, I jump the infill back to 25%. Now, first couple layers are gonna have a couple of missing bits, but that's okay, it's infill. The point is, by the time it gets to the actual top layers of the model, there will be a solid bed of 25% infill under it, and I'll get that nice, pretty top layer. If you look at the end of the video, you're going to see what I'm talking about, that real nice, pretty top layer. And that's how you get that. If you try to print that kind of a top layer with 5% infill, good luck. <laughs> Maybe if you did five or six top layers, it might, you know, finish bridging, but you're probably still going to have bubbles. You, you just, you really need support. You're doing a large bridge and you really want to have support. And your infill is your support. Let's see what that looks like in the slice. Select all, continuous layer by layer. Da, 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 da. Ooh, copyright trolls. <laughs> there we go. So here is the slice. Now the way this works, first layer is just infill and the perimeters which saves you a lot of time. And guess what else it does? It makes part removal really easy because you don't have this entire surface area glued down to your print, or your print bed. So part removal is a whole lot easier. 
even with a flex bed it just like you i don't even i don't even manage to get the flex bed off the printer and it pops the print right off it's it's wonderful and of course you need to be doing a model where it's okay to not have bottom layers this model is a planter it's okay if this doesn't have bottom layers i'm totally okay with that so let's go by layer so as you can see here we then get our layers here now the reason i do this is these slicers are stupid so let me show you what i'm talking about you see how you got sections here that are bridging and they stop in the middle of the actual infill uh, simplify theory refuses to fix that i've been telling them this about for years they won't fix it they say well that's the way it's supposed to be use more infill i don't want to use more freaking infill that takes time and it wastes material when you should just be smart enough to tell your slicer this is the perimeter i want so draw this line all the way out to here how hard is that just draw this line out to here and then i could probably get away with 10 percent infill here <laughs> and save another hour of print time but whatever maybe eventually that'll happen but here as you can see by using 25 percent infill my gaps here what's the scale i don't know what the scale is but it's very tiny uh do i have one i can show you yeah actually i do you can see the actual gaps are quite tiny and believe it or not a dead overhang over a gap that tiny works surprisingly well the the filament has inertia and it has plasticity and it will actually air bridge with nothing under it a gap that tiny surprisingly well and so 25 percent infill works now once we're done that we switch to five percent you can see here we're using very little infill now what i wanted to show you you're saying why turn off top and bottom layers there is no top and bottom layers oh contraire my friend there is top and bottom layers have you ever made a print with three let's say three perimeters and you make the print and it goes one two three and then it moves all over the place and goes that's this see all this yellow stuff inside the orange perimeter here see all that stuff right there that's top and bottom layers. It's doing that because the slicer is assuming that because the shape is curved, you need a little bit more overhang support there. So it's building, it's bridging overhang support as a basically a fourth perimeter. But because it's not going to do it, it's going and then it's coming over here and go like this section right here. It'll go here and go and then it'll jump over here and go well, that adds a lot of time to the print. <laughs> More time than the perimeters. The perimeters are quick. And then a little slower. But that stuff takes forever. If you ever have a print going and hear that... It, that's what it's doing. It's doing top and bottom layers. Ostensibly, that's a good thing. It's helping make your more structural integrity for your print. But if you're already doing three perimeters, that's 1.2 millimeters thick. And the part doesn't have a lot of really bad overhangs. You might be able to get away with turning that off. Now, of course, you need the top and bottom layers for the bottom section and the top section. But because I'm already multi-process, I can get away with that. So you see here, this is 26 hours. Probably more like 32. Okay? So 26 hours. And that's how long the slicer says. Okay? So here's more. See? All this yellow here. All this, all this yellow you see on the inside of the orange perimeters. All that yellow, that's all for the overhang. See, all that stuff there. So if you turn off those top and bottom layers, you get rid of all that. So it saves you a lot of time. Now we go up to the top. Come on, I missed it. Got it. And at some point here, now you see where the top and bottom layers help might be here. See here? See how I, I got all three perimeters exposed here? This is why it does that. So this model, it might not work. See? All this stuff is top layer. But if you look, one, two, three. Now let's go up a layer. And you can see, one, two, three. There's only one perimeter holding this entire set of three up. So these two perimeters right here, these two orange ones, are sitting above thin air. There's nothing there, unless 
it draws this section here to support it. That's why it does that. That's why, and that's why it has to do it for many layers. It has to build it up over time. Now you could also do that with infill. If you increase your infill count to 25% for the whole model, you could definitely get rid of this. So you'd have to see what's faster, what uses more material. This doesn't save a whole lot of material turning it off, but it saves a lot of time. On this print, mm, maybe four perimeters would give you enough support. Yeah, you might be able to get away. You're not going to get away with a three. You can see it here. You got parts hanging in midair, but you might be able to get away with a four. So we'll test that in the slicer just a, as a what if. I decided to play it safe. I didn't want to print it twice. And these overhangs concern me a little bit. So I was like, eh, it's only, I'm only going to save five or six hours. Leave it on. And it was the first big print on a new printer. I wanted to give it its best shot. Then here we go. You see here. So here we are at 5%, and then the next layer switches to 25%. So it's going to bridge all of this infill, but because the bridge isn't this entire gap from here to here being bridged, it's bridging from the 5% infill points. You're going to have pretty good success with that. You know, 80% of this is going to complete properly. And by the time you get three or four layers of infill, it'll be 100% complete because, you know, it, it, printing is pretty good at doing that short little bridging like that with nothing on the end, cantilevered. So eventually, you know, it, you know, fail, 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 but it's failing a little less. And eventually you get it complete. So that's why I switch from five. That's why I have to have any infill at all. And that's why I switch from 5% to 25% here so that all that bridging mess happens inside the model where you can't see it. And the result is when you finally get to your top layers, this also gives you structural integrity at the top of the model because most people pick up a pot by grabbing, they're either going to grab the pot by the bottom like this or they're going to grab the pot by the edge like this. And so you want those two parts to be pretty strong. Although this is small enough, I'm not too worried about that. And then that's it. Now you have something to actually print your top layers on. So even your first top layer is going to be almost perfect because you have that 25% support, infill support underneath it. And then I get my four top layers so that if I do have any problems with one of those layers, I've got four chances to fix it and have that nice clean top surface, which you guys have already, you'll, you'll see later, but you get that really nice clean top surface. And that's how you get that. So that's just some, my thought process. <laughs> My thought process as I'm conducting a slice, um, just for the shiggles, let's take away the top and bottom layers here. We saw it's 26 hours, seven minutes. If I get rid of those top and bottom layers, it takes a second to process. I could pause it for a second, but it's just not going to save that much time. There we go. Now here you can see, see how we got a hole right there? That's actually a hole, you can see right through that. And that will cause further errors down the road. Looks like most of these layers probably would have worked, maybe. Probably enough to close the model, but this area would have been sketchy here. There's an actual hole there. So I would probably leave them on. Um, you can also sometimes have just top or bottom on, not both. But as you can see, it knocked six hours off the print time. <laughs> so your printer spent six hours going, dit, 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 making all that little bit support. Now, what would happen if I made a four? Because four might be enough. Because I don't care if there's a tiny hole, as long as it doesn't cause the print to fail. That's all that matters to me. So let's see what happens if I do... Four. And I'm going to, can I pause this? I don't think I can. No, I don't think I can. Ooh, I think I changed my settings for this. I hope I didn't mess them up. <laughs> yeah. So here you can see we now have four here. So one, two, three, four. And this is part of infill. And that it's pretty safe there's a there's a pretty good chance that would work you know there might be a little divot here because this is printing with nothing underneath it but for the most part that might work and this will definitely work at no point do i see more than three exposed 
and I only saved two hours. So only saving two hours by adding a fourth perimeter, I would just leave it at three perimeters and leave the top and bottom layers on. It's not a big enough time savings versus potential collapse of portions of the model that would look icky to be worth it. If it was five or six hours, yes, I would do it. But for two hours, eh, just let it go. It's going to be a little more than that because of acceleration. The slicer is not taking into account my X3 P300 acceleration values. So that's why 26 hour print takes 32 hours. It, it, it's not properly calculating those acceleration values. So it might actually be like three or four hours, but even still a 30 hour print, four hours, is just not a big deal. Leave it at three with the top and bottom layers turned on. And that's it. That's our slice. And next up, I will show you different steps as we print. Enjoy. So here's that little monkey cup that came with the printer for the stream. I printed a little tiny one and it came out very well. Really, really well, actually. Now I'm pretty, a giant one. I'm gonna use this as a plant pot. Who thought this was a good idea? So I start off with no bottom layers and 25% infill only until I get to the bottom of the plant pot. And then I switch to 5% infill because you don't really need a whole lot of info with the rest of it. And then at the very top, I'll show you later, I switch back to 25% infill so that the top layers will look nice and pretty. And three perimeters, of course. This should take about 30 to 32 hours. So this is why you use the 25%. The slicers today, all of them, they're not smart enough to realize that you need to stop this top layer here past where you need it on top of a bridging support. So meaning on top of some infill. So the only way around it is to simply have enough infill that that layer correctly forms. And because I want this to look extra pretty, I'm using four top layers to increase the chance that this will look very nice when it's done. I'll show you that again when it finishes a couple layers and you'll see how nice it comes out. And there's the second layer. So as you can see, we have a more complete circle because there's less holes for the top layer to fall into. So you get a better interior surface that way. So as you can see here, the result of that infill choice means my bottom layer is really really clean on the inside of this pot so it looks nice and now that I no longer need the 25% infill I switched over to 5% infill for doing the walls and the rest of the print saves a lot of time and saves a lot of filament alrighty I am going to bed that's the progress it's made in five hours so another 25 to 30 hours to go I've also turned down the heat bed 10 degrees at a time until I got to 40. 40 is pretty close room temperature, you can barely feel it's warm. So now I've turned it off. So thanks to the Wham Bam PC surface, I don't need to use a heat bed. So the heat bed is now off, and as you can see, no peeling. So this printer now only consumes about 40 or 50 watts of electricity. You know, it's just enough to run the heater and the electronics and the motors. So very little power, which means that the power goes out. Those things will run this printer for hours. <laughs> but um, there you go. We will come back tomorrow and check the progress. Well, the first one failed overnight. I restarted it. I checked. It wasn't a clog. You know, I could push the filament through. But the filament was broken. And it kept hitting the PTFE tube on this end. So it wasn't feeding. Um, I don't know why the filament broke, but we'll get to that later. I started it again, and this failed again. Now, I actually didn't see it fail. I noticed that that was loose. <laughs> this happens a lot on printers, so if you have an issue that looks like some sort of clogging, sometimes it's not. Sometimes the grub screws on your drive gear here are loose. And I noticed it because the drive gear got pushed up, and so it wasn't even touching the filament anymore. And then when I checked, I realized there's a gap. It had failed. And that was because the grub screws were loose on the drive gear on the extruder stepper motor. So I canceled the print, reset the drive gear, retightened the grub screws, and we are going again. Uh, that happens. I should have checked it. That's something that I get into the habit of checking on all printers from now on. But as you can see, pretty good print to start with. I'm blowing this up so the resolution is going to be a little bit low. Why isn't this autofocusing? There we go. So, not bad. Good print. I did no bottom, so it saves a lot of time. That takes about an hour off the print time just by removing the bottom, which you don't really need. The inside looks really nice. 
I'm actually going to go check and see if this is watertight. Nice and smooth. Looks like I got the extrusion multiplier right. 0.92 seems to be about spot on for the Sprinter. But we will come back once we've exceeded this progress. So seven or eight hours, I'll record another clip. And there you go, 36 hours later. And removing it is as easy as just flipping up the magnetic sheet and it pops off. And that came out really nice. Little tail there, because that's an overhang. Yeah, I got no complaints about that. Most of this is actually texture in the model itself. Looks like this is a scan of some sort. Yeah, it's about beautiful. About perfect, actually. Nice. And there you go. There's my new pot plant. I'm going to put my lettuce in.